This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. I wouldn't want to discourage anyone from doing it. Like, if you think it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard. I'm at the venue like seven days a week, whether it's doing the wages or, you know, doing some ordering or doing some maintenance on the days off. It's, it's, it's tough, but it's also like, it's so rewarding at the same time. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Often the mentality in hospitality is, if you build it, they will come. Hospitality is all about building one's dreams and giving people an experience to remember. But what does it take to build this dream in a quiet and unexpected location? Emile Avramides is the chef and owner of Clove Lane in Randwick, Sydney. Emile, how are you? Very good, thanks, Hark. Yourself? I'm good. It's great to get you on the show. You've got a, a great little venue there, sort of tucked away in a, in a busy suburb, but uh, if you don't know about it, you don't know about it. But um, tell us a little bit about Clove Lane. Yeah, so, I mean, Clove Lane, it's, it's, a, funny, it's a funny one, really. It's, it's a little bit under the radar, um, but at the same time, it's, it's a bit of a beast as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know... Um, we, we set it up, we weren't actually looking in this location when, when we first, uh, you know, got to Sydney and thought it's time to open my own venue. Um, but, but it popped up on the search and I don't know, there was something about the location that just dragged me in and setbacks, there was plenty of setbacks and every time I came back to the venue, I just thought, nah, we're going to make this work. So here we are. Well, you've become a real amazing hub of that community. But one of the beautiful things is the transformation of that building, and and um, you've you've um, detailed that on your website, which is fascinating. T- tell us about what state it was in when you took the site and and what you did to it. Well, yeah, basically it was it was pretty in in disrepair, really. I mean, the the floor in the front was rotted out. Um, we brought gas into the building, rewired the entire place, knocked out some walls. Um, and, you know, we didn't have a big budget because th- there's, no, there's no backing behind it. It's, it's, it's sort of um, chef-funded. Um, so, so the idea was if we knock down a wall or we, we, pull, we pull something off the walls and we just scrape it back, that's the feature, that's it, done, move on. So that's how, that's how we ended up with the – with the, the layout and the design, it was kind of just dictated to us by the building. I want to explore what you're doing there in a little while because it's such a great little venue and, as you say, a little bit under the radar. Um, but take us back to when you were young. What sort of role did food play in your family? Uh, well, my father was a restaurateur, so um, well, I've always been around restaurants, I guess, and, and definitely food. Um, my background's Lebanese and, you know, from a young age – Sunday lunches at my grandmother's house were, well, actually, they're quite an inspiration for, for how I cook now, to be honest. You know, there's that large amount of people, everyone, um, uh, how do you explain it? Like the social aspect of it all, you know, people coming together and, and the hospitality behind it all. Um, and I guess Clove Lane's a lot like that in some ways in that it's, you, you, you know, you kind of feel like you're coming into someone's home and, it's you, it's kind of interactive. The kitchen's so open, like you've seen it. It's um, to hide for the chefs. It's it's kind of interactive, really. When did you first uh, start to think about a career in food? Was that somewhere uh, sort of a direction that you were always headed? Uh, no, actually, I um, I started front of house, um, and that was just as a casual casual job, just to 
pay the way while I was at uni. I was studying an IT degree, was completely not relevant to food at all. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and just as time progressed, I realized more and more that I didn't, I wasn't really into IT at all. Uh, mind you, it took me a few years to work that out. And then my mother got back into the game. She got a uh, cafe in Melbourne and I, I went and worked for her and still front of house at this stage. And then the kitchen was struggling a bit. I found myself in the kitchen helping out this, that, and the other. And once we, we put on a chef with, you know, excellent credentials, I was sold. I was, once I got in the kitchen, he was showing me how to make things properly. Um, it, it just didn't feel like work anymore. Tell us about some of the first things um, that you remember making that sort of made an impact on you. Um, that's, that's an easy one. The first thing that, that, that blew me away really was um, I was cooking out of a, a book by Marco Pierre White called Canteen Cuisine. And as my chef kept teaching us, um, you know, these different techniques, etc., those dishes then became part of the menu. So um, there's a brilliant recipe of a parfait. Uh, with with foie gras, and you know when you take when you take livers, some onion, bit of alcohol, and then you turn it into a parfait. I mean that transformation; it's just mind blowing. So that was it for me. Like seeing seeing that book, um, and at the time as well, Charlie Trotter's stuff. You know, so visually appealing. Um, yeah, I was sold. You spent a lot of your career in the UK. To, to tell us about what triggered that move and what it was like for you. Um, <laughs> what triggered the move? Well, I was going, my wife and I, well, we weren't married at the time, uh, we're on a European trip, supposedly backpacking. Um, we'd planned to be away for about six months, but nature of the beast was that we were dining at Michelin restaurants, etc., and ran out of money pretty quickly. Um, so I contacted my brother who was living in Edinburgh at the time just to get some extra cash. We headed up there, didn't leave, um, was introduced to, to the French laundry cookbook while I was there. And again, that was, that was inspirational as well. Um, found a, found a book called tough cookies, which, um, have you read Tough Cookies? No, that sounds great. Uh, it's great. It's a really good book. It's it's about four four chefs. Um, I think it's Anton Mossman, um, Gordon Ramsay. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, Heston Blumenthal and Marcus Waring. I'm pretty sure the four. And and once I read those stories, I was like, wow, this Gordon. I'm going to go work for this guy. Um, but it wasn't actually my decision. My wife got a job in London, which took us down there. And I, we had met while we were traveling, as it turned out, um, there, was a, there was a guy named Danny Rampling who had, who had, you know, contact with Jason Atherton at Mays and um, his mate, Tim Payne, who was funnily enough the head chef at Canteen. And so when I hit London, I hit them up and eventually ended up at, at Mays. Wow. What, what was that kitchen like compared to what you'd been used to? Maze was incredible. Like Jason, and, and that's a big team, right? Like you got 16 or so chefs on service. Um, you know, I think, I think we worked out, you could do something like two and a half thousand plates in a dinner service. Um, at a one Michelin star standard, it was, it was, it, oh, it was just incredible. Like, you know, every morning you'd wake up and think, why am I doing this? Like, you know, You'd be on the on the tube with your eyes closed, counting the counting the stops, you know, trying to get that little bit of extra sleep. And then once you got into the kitchen and the buzz of the kitchen, it's like, oh yeah, that's what it's all about. So, I mean, compared to what I'd experienced in Australia, it was it was nothing. It was not even close. But the other thing that was that was amazing about that joint was it was a real team. Like there was camaraderie there. You know, if 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 say someone on the meat section, he just spilt something on the floor or knocked something over, the guys on fish will run over and help him clean it up, you know. And my first job in London was with Tom Akins and that was just the opposite, you know. There was no com camaraderie there. I mean, take nothing away from Tom. His food is bloody unreal, but yeah. I, I, was, I, was, just, uh, I was just in love with that kitchen, mate. It was awesome. 
you you also uh, worked in a in a pub um, over there. What, what was that like? Yeah, that was great. Like, um, I went to it was called the Albion in Islington, and the chef there was Richard Turner, who was um, who also had an amazing CV and um, was very much a meat focused restaurant uh, or pub, I should say. Um, yeah, it was awesome. Oh, we do whole suckling pigs. Um, there was um, rare breed pork and and same with the beef. It was just it was just awesome. What triggered the move to come home and uh, what was it like for you coming back and trying to um, sort of immerse yourself in the industry here? Yeah. Um, what triggered the move? We basically, uh, we had come home to get new visas uh, to go back to London and in that period of time, fell pregnant with my first child. Um, we went we went back to London and thought, oh, hold on a second. Might be better if we do this at home, you know, with the support of the grandparents, etc. So, so we decided a few months later to come back and and uh, yeah, get back into got back down to Melbourne and I started helping out a friend of mine, um, a butcher in Elwood. And if, before you know, before you know it helping out one day, two days, the next thing you know, I'm doing 60 odd hours there a week. So (laughs) it's, um, it was a great experience though. Did, did a lot of, you know, pre-prepared meals and, um, obviously learned some butchery as well along the way. So, yeah. Um, but it was, it was at, it was at Felicia's place, um, where I saw an ad in the paper for sushi to the open Cutler and Co. And that was a no brainer because like Andrew McConnell's, well, he's incredible, right? But his respect for produce and producers is it's inspirational. So that was a that was an easy sort of sidestep for me to, to get back into proper kitchens, I suppose. Take us into that kitchen. What, what was it like being part of that sort of Cutler and Co. as it was getting up and running? Do you have any stories of that time? Uh, it was tough. It was really tough. Um, I learned I learned like so much. I, I thought I could cook. Um, but going in there was completely different style to what I what I knew, and it, it was just incredible. Like Andrew's Andrew's touch on food, it's it's like still now. It's, I, I just look at look back on it and what an inspiration that was. Like, um, but it was it was a tough kitchen, I suppose, much smaller, but still doing some serious numbers, um, and a really good team. But yeah. Andrew's known for um, highlighting the best produce in the country and trying to do as little to it as possible. What, what sort of insights did that experience give you to and connections to producers? Uh, that that was amazing, really. That was for me. That was really the first kitchen in Melbourne um, that allowed me to connect to producers like that. Like even even after my time at that kitchen, and you know, going going out to farms and 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 see you know, really connect with the producers and what, what they're making. It's, it's something that like, it's just, you just got to see the other side, right? Like it's, it's unreal. You get a real appreciation for what, for what they're doing and how, how things are ending up on the plate. And I guess it also allows you to fully respect the produce that you're working with. You know, I mean, for us, especially at Clove, um, like wastage, it's just a no, no, like there's, if you're trimming something down, you need to be creative enough to know what you're going to use that trim for, you know. Um, it's a challenge, but it's, you know, you've heard of a lot of kitchens where they'll buy produce in, I don't know, pick flowers off, off rosemary and throw the rosemary in the bin. Like, that does make no sense to me. So, uh, Tell us about your first head chef role. What was that change like for you and what were the challenges that you faced? Oh, well... I was really hungry. Obviously, May's Melbourne didn't last very long. So, um, I mean, we had a lot of great, great young kids come through there. Um, everyone was driven. Uh, I know you've, you've had a few of the boys on your show already. Um, but, yeah, when that went, um, there was an opportunity to, to join uh, the point at Albert Park. And, again, that was I had a lot of experience with meat by this stage, obviously having been with Richard Turner and um, – uh, in London and cooking meat at May's Melbourne. So 
you know, the point very, very well known for its, its mate selection, etc. Um, I was just hungry for that. So, so that was, that was an easy progression for me. Not easy to work wasn't easy, but just easy to make that decision to go into that next step. How did you make that balance of creativity and sort of mentoring staff as well? Were there challenges in that period? Yeah. Look, to be honest, um, I suppose my style back then was a, a little bit, it was a little bit antiquated in that it reflected some of the stuff I'd seen in London. And I, you could, uh, when I look back on it now, I think I was probably a bit of an asshole, but I mean, at the end of the day, it wasn't about me personally or the other chef personally. It was just, here's this product that we're trying to get to the customer. And I want it to be fucking perfect, you know? So uh, there was nothing going to get in, in our way to, to, to stop that. So yeah, it was a bit, I don't know, looking back, maybe it was a little bit, a little bit wrong, but um, live and learn, right? What triggered the move to Sydney? Um, well, I'm a Sydney boy. I was born in Sydney. So uh, my wife got, got a job up here, um, got offered a promotion to come back. And for me, I was in the process of looking for my own venue. So I was, I was fine. Whether I was looking in Melbourne or Sydney, it, it didn't concern me. So um, I, was, I was all in. I'm like, let's do it. Let's go to Sydney and have a crack. We, at the top of the show, we talked briefly about um, you finding the site Clo- for Clove Lane. Um, tell us a bit about the idea of it at the beginning and um, sort of some of the challenges you had at the beginning um, getting it up and running. Uh, it's too many challenges to, to <laughs> too many too many challenges to, to number. To be honest, I mean, obviously, councils can be can be somewhat difficult to, to navigate. Um, and yeah, there was a few holdups with the build, etc. But we knew that we wanted to open a neighborhood bistro. Um, I'd been inspired by um, Gabe Stulman from New York, who has a number of venues there now, but he's got a great, he did a great TED talk called Heart and Soul of the Neighborhood Restaurant. And it just, it just resonated with me. So I'm like, yeah, this guy, this guy's got it going on. Like, this is what I want to create. I want a place where, where people just, Basically, we wanted to create the cheers of restaurants, you know, and and that's and that's what that's what we just that's what we tried to do, and I think that's what we have achieved. So, if you think of Clove Lane when it first opened, did did it change quite a bit, sort of working with the local community to create that hub? Like it's a constant evolution. Uh, the venues evolved over time, um, but the community has been so supportive. I, I feel like really lucky that we actually opened here considering that this wasn't an area that we were originally looking for, but like, you know, obviously hitting, hitting lockdown and stuff and like this whole community just got behind us and we we're able to do takeaway and um, yeah, but the venue itself, yeah, it's, it's, it's under a constant evolution and I don't know. It's, it's, it's good. Definitely got its own personality. You know, a lot of that you could say has to do with me. And I think a lot of it just has to do with, everyone else who who's been a part of it whether they're whether they're chefs waiters or the customers themselves like it's it's definitely got its own its own personality now so you you mentioned that ted talk and um your vision to create that sort of neighborhood bistro what's important in creating um a successful sort of neighborhood uh, restaurant i mean it has to be obviously approachable it, it it's funny when, when we set out, we didn't think we were going to be, um, I guess, a special occasion restaurant. We thought it would be more the drop in, have a glass of wine, a chat and a snack, that sort of thing. Um, so that was important that people felt comfortable enough to just, to just drop in. Um, however, having said, said that, you know, most of our, most of our covers are done via bookings. There's not that much walking that happens. Um, but what's important about a neighborhood? Yeah, it's just the hospitality, right? Like, it's funny. You can, dining out, there's so many amazing restaurants out there. Sometimes you almost think, are they forgotten that this industry is called hospitality? Like, you know, and so having a warm greeting and a smile or, or staff who are, you know, may lack experience but make up with enthusiasm, for me, that was fine. I, I, I didn't need to 
I didn't need everything to be perfect. Just needed everyone to be comfortable. Restaurants often take a bit of time to sort of find their feet, sort of a year or two. Was there a moment when you kind of realised everything was sort of working in order and the restaurant was sort of um, going in the direction you wanted it to? Um, look, we, we were really lucky to get off to a really good start. I mean, there was myself, Michael Tran and Corey Campbell. Um, and so, you know, Corey's, Corey's an amazing chef. He's... Yeah, he's, he's an inspiration for a young guy. He's just, uh, he's brilliant. So ha- having that, that team to open with, I guess, um, got us off to a really good start in that we had, yeah, we were busy pretty much from, from the get-go. So that was, that was really lucky, really lucky. So, um, you know, yeah, sorry. That's, uh, that's all I can think of. It was a, it was a really, it was a really, I think we were just really lucky. Tell us a little bit about your food and your style of cooking. Is is there a, a dish or two you can sort of take us through that sort of exemplify what you're doing? Well, I'd like to say not really. Um, the way <laughs> I know that doesn't make sense, but the way we cook here, it's it's very what I like to consider intuitive. Um, say, for example, we get a list from our producers of what's available for next week, and we'll order based on what's available for the next week. Once the produce comes in, we sort of put our heads together um, and come up with dishes. And, and, you know, if those dishes may be on for three days, they might be on for two weeks. It just depends. So um, in, terms of, in terms of the style of cooking, it's, it's to be honest. Um, but I've got, I've got a, a great team at the moment, you know, Indy Hocking and, and Soren Togus and like these guys, us together, it's, it's a great team and we can literally sit down in the morning and claim what produce we want to use and then, you know, once if I've, if I've claimed celeriac, well then too bad, you can't use it. So, and then, <laughs> you know, um, and, and that's how we design our menu. So it can literally change, it can literally change every day. It sounds like a very collaborative sort of uh, effort in the kitchen. Tell us about that process and um, the empowerment that you give your chefs. Yeah, sure. It, it's it's a hundred percent collaborative. I mean, you can learn something from from everybody. You can learn from some kid who's come in for a stage or or for a trial. He might show you something if you just if you you know just keep your eyes and your ears open. You're going to pick up plenty. So rather than me dictating, um, we sit down. We we talk about what's coming in, or, and we do that every day. Um, and or we might we might have a supplier who's who's dropped off something that's new and interesting for us, you know, whether it's a cheese or whatever, and see how we can use that. So, and like I mentioned before, like a lot of the time it's, I don't know, say say we're trimming pork belly and there's some there's some trim there, we might be turn that into a kremeski or something like that. So um, now we have this this pork. Well, what's that going to go with? So then someone else might chime in and throw a few ideas, and before you know it, you've got you've got a full menu. You mentioned uh, the importance of the community and the support that you've got. What what sort of uh, impact has that had during COVID? Tell tell us a little bit about that period of time and um, and how you got the restaurant through it. Yeah. Okay. So the f- the first lockdown, we um, I mean, obviously everyone was in the same boat, right? But um, we we went pretty quickly to to take away, um, and the thought process was. If we've got something to sell, we'll survive. So we brought our whole dry store from upstairs downstairs. We put all our all our wine on display and we, we you know, I, I think you remember everyone was finding it hard to get toilet paper and pasta and all this stuff. Well, a lot of the hospitality industry, we had access to all that stuff. So we just set up shop in the front, like a little little grocery store sort of market. And um, and just like I said, as, as long as we had something to sell, we were going to survive. Uh the second lockdown, and, and our, our community really got behind us. Um, people would literally walk in going like, what can I buy? Well, I was prepared to sell the tables, the chairs, whatever, <laughs> whatever it took. But um, on the second one, we went into more of a pre-prepared uh, meal box. And that, that was, I think that was more successful for us. Um, but it was, it was tough. It was really tough mentally. Like, 
you know, we like I was home at night time most of the time, and and that was something that's quite unusual. I've got four kids, you know, and so that was that, that was nice, but that was different. Um, and yet, it was it was really draining the work that we were doing. Load was was really was really tough. Not so much the physical side, but yeah. Did that sort of um, period of time uh, change your focus, or sort of change? what you want to get out of uh, hospitality moving forward? Uh, no, I, I love service. You know, I've, I've done a little bit of everything. I've, you know, I've worked in cafes and pubs and uh, I've done catering. And and what I've come to realise is that, I, like, I just love service. So I know that I don't, you know, and, and that lockdown period, just it felt like catering to me. And so, you know, having the nights off was nice, but, but, I don't know, maybe I'm a night owl. I just, I love service. I love, I love the energy. I love being a part of the restaurant. It's, um, it's, I'd like to say it's not going to, that's not ever going to change, but you know, I always see myself still, still on the, on the stove cooking forever. But, um, yeah, I, I just, hopefully I'm, hopefully I just continue in, in the restaurants forever. There's something interesting that you brought up at the beginning of the show, which is the fact that Clove Lane is a little bit under the radar. You know, a lot of um, chefs and restaurants are, you know, glorified in the media a lot. And you're sort of um, plugging away with a really successful restaurant. What does it feel like sort of operating under the radar like that, but being quite successful at it? Uh, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I've I've spent a lot of time in some, you know, I guess you'd say high profile restaurants. And I've always been happy to be part of the engine room, you know. Um, it's I guess it's just my personality being happy just to just to crank it out, you know, be the first one in and the last one out. It's you know, I I don't need you to tell me like pat me on the back and say whatever. It's like, if if I find that work rewarding, like you know, that's 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 my reward. So um Look, I'm I'm happy. We're lucky. Look, we're lucky at Clove because it's so open that the customers can show us their appreciation. We can see it on the, on their faces or, or whatever. So, um, just on that, I, I have to let you know we've actually just sold. Wow. Yeah, I know. I thought I might get to that a little bit sooner, but um, it's uh, it hasn't really been my focus because you know, like I'm so invested. It's almost like it's not real. Um, but uh, we've got a, another industry professional coming in to take over, Roy McVeigh. And, you know, Clove Lane will continue as it is. Um, you know, staff are staying on, the name stays on, the style stays, everything stays, just maybe the old chef goes. <laughs> well, that's definitely a spanner in the works. Uh, what, what triggered that move? Um, well, to be honest, um, look, when I when we first opened here, I had, I had business partners as well that – it didn't, you know, we had another venue in Melbourne, a pub down there, and it, it just was a little bit difficult. So we ended up splitting up. Um, and so I've basically been here for, well, the, the restaurant's about to have its sixth birthday plus a year of build. Um, and it's kind of just on, it's on my shoulders a lot, you know. And it's not that I, I don't feel like I'm burning out. I just feel like ready for a change. So I thought to myself, look, I'll put it on the market it's probably going to take a really long time to sell and I'll just go about my business. But as it turned out, it didn't take long at all. So here we are. And I'm like, oh, shit, what have I done? How are you feeling about it all after building it up from the ground and creating this incredible sort of neighborhood hub? Yeah, mixed emotions, to be honest. Um, I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm still so invested and we've got such a great culture here. Like, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, it's so it's so good to be with these people. Um, I mean, like you know, about a month ago, <coughs> excuse me, we we closed the key, we closed the restaurant on a Saturday night, so so the crew could go out and see Boris Brecker down at Horton Pavilion, and you know, it, it was just awesome. I mean, for a restaurant owner, probably the most expensive concert I've ever been to, but uh, <laughs> but worth it, you know, absolutely worth it, and. So for sure, I'll miss that stuff in the short term. But I'm, you know, I'm sure something will come up, um, you know, in the next whatever period of time. But yeah, very mixed emotions. People keep congratulating me, and I and I've kind of like I don't know how to accept these congratulations because I feel so like 
you know, oh, what? I'm losing my baby. <laughs> well, just just on that, the, with the such a sort of captured market and committed customers, uh, what's the reaction been from your customers? Well, they don't all know yet. That's something that we um, <laughs> <laughs> something we'll be getting out very shortly. Um, but you know, the one the ones who do know, um, well, they just I, I, I'm trying to let them rest assured that you know the show goes on. Um, you know, obviously, it, it, this sort of venue means a lot to a lot of people, whether it's they had their child's christening here or they, they got married or it was their anniversary or whatever. And well, I guess that's just the impact that hospitality can have in people's lives, you know. So, Well, you built an incredible venue there. What sort of impact does that sort of the energy required to create um, such a successful venue, what sort of impact has that had on you? What sort of impact? I mean, it's it's tough, like... I, I don't want to – I wouldn't want to discourage anyone from doing it. Like as as a chef coming through the ranks, I, I always saw myself in my own venue um, and I wouldn't want to discourage anyone. But like if you think it's going to be hard, it's going to be fucking hard. Like it's – you know, I'm, pra- I'm at the venue like seven days a week, whether it's doing the wages or, you know, doing some ordering or doing some maintenance on the days off. Um, so it's, it's tough, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, but it's also like, it's so rewarding at the same time. I know you uh, mentioned that you, you're not sure what you're going to do next, but do you, do you have some thoughts or do you have some plans on, on what might happen sort of once you let go of Cloveline? Um, well, specifically, I'd like to do nothing for a little bit, actually, just, uh, you know, you know, sort of regroup and, and um, clear my mind a little bit. Uh, I think the other thing with with working at this intensity is you can sometimes, you can put so much care into the people around you and the food you're preparing and all that sort of stuff that you lose a little bit of care for yourself. And so it will be nice to just, yeah, revitalize a little bit Um get back into the gym and do all those things that I keep telling myself I'm too busy for. So, so that's my first goal. Like I mentioned, I've got four kids. So um, our house is pretty busy most of the time. So I'll, I'll have plenty to do. Um, well, having um, fostered so many great connections with the local community and built a real sort of neighborhood bistro for them, um, what's it going to feel like when you hand the keys over and sort of do that last shift? Um yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's going to be a very late night. That's for sure. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, we've got we've got an event coming up for Delicious One One Hundred. Oh, not sorry, not Delicious One Hundred. Um, Delicious Month Out. It's called Chef Snacks and Tracks, and and that's uh, on the sixth of May. That's a night where. Basically, the chefs are going to take control of the sound system, which is scary enough in itself. Um, and chef snacks referring to little dishes that we snack on in the kitchen. So, for example, you know, rather than having a fully curated, you know, main course in the kitchen, if, if the parfait is there, you might take a scoop of that. There's a little bit of caviar, throw that on top, boom, one mouthful. Amazing, right? So it's like that ugly, delicious vibe. There's so much going on in the kitchen, so many little offcuts here, this, that, and the other. Um, and so we decided to make a menu around that and to, to, yeah, just to tie it all in, we thought, well, then let's let the chefs make the soundtrack as well. So it's going to be a, it's probably going to be a wild night, but it's going to be enjoyable for sure. How are you going to remember your time at uh, Clove Lane? Um, I, I, look, it, like I said, it's been tough, but it's been really rewarding as well. So I, I love it. Like, I've, we've met we've met so many so many people whether it's staff or, or customers and nothing but good memories really it's um it's it's a great little venue and, and i hope i hope for the new people it just it just carries on as well so well uh i mean amazing to have you on deep in the weeds today and even more amazing to um get a bombshell yeah. towards the end yeah of the yeah <laughs> Well, um, please keep in touch and really look forward to seeing um, what you do next. All right. Thanks, Huck. Appreciate it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>